This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Amrody Waller. On today's Global, nine arrests after a deadly bridge collapse in the Indian state of Gujarat. 141 people are known to have died. Most of the bodies recovered are of women and children. I was here on the bridge. We fell in the center. I was able to escape, but I couldn't find my sister. We'll have the latest live from the town. We'll hear from people at one of the main hospitals and we'll talk to a structural engineer. Also on today's programme. A stunning political comeback as Lula da Silva beats President Bolsonaro in Brazil's elections. Join me, Laura Trevelyan, live in Scranton, Pennsylvania, birthplace of US President Joe Biden, with a week to go until the midterm elections. Hello and welcome to BBC News. Police in India have detained nine people after the deaths of 141 people killed after a suspension bridge collapsed in Gujarat. A BBC reporter at the scene said most of the bodies being recovered were of women and children. They'd been on a pedestrian bridge celebrating a religious festival. Just a warning, the footage we're about to show you is distressing. Well, the bridge had only just reopened after repair work and there are reports it had not yet received a safety certificate People had been seen on the bridge rocking it and trying to make it sway just before it collapsed into the river. Here's Yugita Lamai. Without well, the latest from Kyiv, let me bring you the latest on grain shipments uh, because, of course, that has been very much in the focus since Russia suspended its participation in the UN programme. Uh, well, the UNA chief speaking in the last little while is saying that uh, the grain deal and commitments made remain in force despite Russia's suspension. Uh, they go on to say that 12 ships have sailed out from Ukrainian ports on Monday and two are headed in to load more food. So those are the, the latest comments from the UN aid chief as the UK's Foreign Secretary uh, James Cleverly has uh, urged Russia to stop impeding those grain exports. So we'll keep an eye on that. If there's more, obviously, we'll return to it. Now, still to come on today's programme. We'll be live in the US state of Pennsylvania, the state where President Biden was born. We'll be assessing how voters there are feeling just a week before the US midterm elections. Welcome back to the programme here on BBC World News. It is just over a week to go till the US midterm elections and all eyes are on Pennsylvania. Control of the US Senate could come down to which party wins there. There's a governor's race in Pennsylvania and competitive congressional elections too. Well, President Biden was born in Pennsylvania and won the state back from Donald Trump back in 2020. The BBC's Laura Trevelyan has been taking the political temperature in Joe Biden's birthplace. Laura, thanks very much for now and plenty more from Laura over the coming hours and days. Now, do stay with us because uh, coming up on the programme in the next few minutes, uh, we'll have uh, the latest from uh, the state of Gujarat in India after that collapse of the suspension bridge, uh, 141 people being killed. And uh, we'll get the latest on the investigation. We'll get the latest from the hospitals. Our correspondent is there in the town. So we'll talk to him in our next edition of today's Global. All of that is coming up in a moment or two. Don't go away. This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Amrody Waller. On today's Global, reports of nine arrests following a deadly bridge collapse in the Indian state of Gujarat. 141 people are known to have died. Most of the bodies being recovered are of women and children. I was here on the bridge. We fell in the centre. I was able to escape, but I couldn't find my sister. 
We'll be live in Gujarat with our correspondent who has the latest on that, our main story. Also on today's programme, ticked off why Twitter's new boss Elon Musk could soon charge users for that coveted blue tick. And it's described as Swiss perfection, the passenger train with a hundred coaches setting a new world record. Hello and welcome back to BBC News. Police in India have detained nine people after the deaths of 141 people killed after a suspension bridge collapsed in Gujarat. A BBC reporter at the scene said most of the bodies being recovered were of women and children. They'd been on the pedestrian bridge celebrating a religious festival. We should warn you that the footage we're about to show you is distressing. Well, the bridge had only just reopened after repair work, and there are reports it had not yet received a safety certificate. People had been seen on that bridge rocking it and trying to make it sway just before it collapsed into the river. Well, in the past couple of hours, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi expressed his grief for the victims and their families. Yes, really distressing detail. Roxy, we will leave it there. Thanks very much. And of course, uh, India's uh, Prime Minister due to be there where you are uh, around this time tomorrow. So thanks very much for the latest there on the ground. Now, let's catch up with the business news of the day. And Ben is here. He has an update on some big changes coming to Twitter. Yes, Matthew. Thanks very much. Let me explain. Thanks very much. We're starting to learn a little more about some of those changes that are on the way, perhaps thanks to the new owner of Twitter. That's Elon Musk, of course. The billionaire boss has said the process of gaining a prestigious blue tick could be revised. Reports suggest the firm could start charging around $20 a month just to have that verification. Well, Mr. Musk has also denied a report that he now plans to lay off Twitter workers before the start of next month to avoid having to make payouts. The New York Times reports that Mr. Musk had ordered major job cuts across Twitter's workforce that would take place before the 1st of November. That date is crucial because it's when workers were due to receive shares as part of their pay deal. So what's going on? Well, earlier I spoke to Daniel Ives, who's from Wedbush Securities. I asked him why Mr. Musk is monetizing that elusive blue tick. Uh, let's bring you up to date with some of the other global business headlines this hour. Wheat and corn prices have soared on global markets after Russia pulled out of a deal to allow grain exports from Ukraine through the Black Sea. Russia has suspended the agreement. It did that on Saturday after what it called a massive drone attack on its Black Sea fleet in Crimea. Despite the suspension though, a dozen ships transporting grain have actually departed from Ukrainian ports today. The United States has thrown out criminal charges it brought against the first trader to be jailed for rigging interest rates. Former UBS trader Tom Hayes was the first of 38 people to be prosecuted. He was charged in both the US and the UK and tried in London in 2015. Then he was sentenced to 14 years. That was reduced on appeal to 11 years. But earlier this year, US courts ruled that the prosecutions were misconceived. Uh, that is all your business this hour. And Matthew, that Twitter store is really interesting, isn't it? Because the idea of charging for a blue tick, $20 we think perhaps a month, the big question whether it will elevate those tweets. So if you pay, if you subscribe to Twitter, does that mean you've got a bigger voice just because you've got deeper pockets? I think it that's it really is interesting, but he has to make money given how much he ended up paying and a lot of people think it was over the odds. Yeah, and you might have heard that interview that we did a little earlier there. They were saying overpay by $20 billion. I mean, just the concept of overpaying by that much money I think will be surprising for many. But yes, he's got to find a way of paying back some of that debt. We know he's one of the world's, if not the world's richest man. But crucially, how does he make money from it and what does Twitter look like under new ownership? Big questions. And I think yeah. we're starting to get a sense of what he intends to do. Pay as you go. Yeah, absolutely. Ben, thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. Now, do stay with us because uh, still to come on today's programme, winding its way through the Swiss Alps, the longest passenger train in the world, 100 carriages stretching more than a mile. Spare a thought for the ticket collector.
Welcome back to today's Global here on BBC World News. Our main headlines, reports of nine arrests following a deadly bridge collapse in the Indian state of Gujarat. 141 people are now known to have died. And Lula da Silva wins Brazil's presidential election, but the far-right incumbent Jair Bolsonaro is still to concede defeat. Now, residents in the South Korean capital Seoul uh, mourning the 154 people killed after a crush during Halloween celebrations. Many of the victims were teenagers and adults in their 20s. They died when a crowd surged in a packed alleyway in the capital. Questions over how it happened and whether more should have been done to prevent such a tragedy are growing. Our correspondent Jean McKenzie reports now from Seoul. We're about to take a break. We're also keeping an eye on those uh, Brazil elections. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro is still to actually concede. So all of that coming up in a moment or two. Don't go away. This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Amrily Waller. On today's Global, nine arrests after a deadly bridge collapse in the Indian state of Gujarat. 141 people are known to have died. Most of the bodies recovered are of women and children. I was here on the bridge. We fell in the centre. I was able to escape, but I couldn't find my sister. We'll have the latest from the town. We also hear from a structural engineer, also on today's programme. Ukrainian rockets attack Russian positions as the pushback continues, despite Moscow targeting more of the country's infrastructure. We have a special report from the front line. Look at it. Desolation. This is what months of attritional warfare does to a town. And the authorities in Iran prepare for mass trials after the arrests of thousands of people in weeks of anti-government protests. Welcome back to BBC News. Police in India have detained nine people after the deaths of 141 people killed after a suspension bridge collapsed in Gujarat. A BBC reporter at the scene said most of the bodies being recovered were of women and children. They'd only been on a pedestrian bridge celebrating a religious festival and just a warning, the footage we're about to show you is distressing. Well, the bridge had only just reopened after repair work and there are reports it had not yet received a safety certificate. People had been seen on the bridge rocking it and trying to make it sway just before it collapsed into the river. Here's Yugita Lamai. Now, Ukraine says power and water supplies across the country have been badly hit after Russia launched a wave of missile attacks across the country. In the capital, Kyiv, 80% of residents were without water and about 350,000 apartments had no electricity, according to the mayor, Vitaly Klitschko. Well, Russia has been stepping up its attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure as winter approaches. Our international editor, Jeremy Bowen, has spent the last week travelling through Ukraine from the frontline battlefields of the Donbass to the villages in Kherson, where some of Russia's best troops are concentrated to try to stop the Ukrainian offensive. His report contains some deeply distressing details. Well, sorry to leave that report and we'll play that full report in our next edition here on the programme. But we're going to take you live to the House of Commons because uh, the British Home Secretary, under so much pressure, is just speaking. Investigators must have the necessary space to work. 
I know the whole House will join me in paying tribute to everyone involved in the response, including the emergency services, military, border force, immigration enforcement and the asylum intake unit. Yeah. Well, they were going to come away as uh, the Labour opposition uh, talk about the deeper failures from the government. Uh, Suella Braverman earlier talking about the overcrowding at uh, Manson, the reception centre, going on to talk about the wider immigration system and said that she was appalled when she find out, uh, found out that 35,000 migrants were staying in hotel places but said she'd never blocked using hotels or ignored legal advice. We'll keep an eye on that and bring you more as it comes into us. But we're going to come away because I want to squeeze in one more important story because uh, to Iran now and Two teenagers uh, shot dead by security forces have been buried today as protests continue to sweep across the country. Meanwhile, the authorities in Tehran have announced preparations for the mass trials of nearly a thousand people arrested over the past several weeks of sweeping anti-government protests. Let's talk again to Rana Rampur, who's uh, following all of this from BBC Persian. And Rana, just take us through today's protests that we've seen. Matthew, we received videos of dozens of universities across yeah. Iran where students are protesting and are refusing to attend their classes. Rana, thanks once again for uh, being on the programme and taking us through all of that. Uh, just a quick pointer for our next edition of uh, Global. We'll have the latest from Westminster after we heard there from the Home Secretary. We also had to interrupt our special report from Jeremy Bowen uh, from Ukraine. So uh, here in half an hour's time, we'll have that full report from the front line. So uh, hopefully in 30 minutes, I'll see you then. Bye for now. BBC World News, the biggest African and international news stories. Focus on Africa. This is Focus on Africa. I'm Lequesa Burak. Our top stories. The DRC expels the Rwandan ambassador accusing Kigali of supporting M23 rebels as hostilities escalate in eastern Congo. 120 people are killed in Saturday's twin bomb attack in Mogadishu as survivors recall the horrors of the atrocity. I had a stationery store here. My friends were sitting in it. I left them to buy something nearby and then the blast happened. I fell down, I ran back and everyone was dead. Also in the programme, a crisis like never before. We are in a crisis. I do not exaggerate when I say so. President Akufo Addo seeks to reassure Ghanaians as he turns to the IMF in an attempt to shore up the economy. And in the sport today, the African Women's Champions League kicks off in Morocco. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa, coming to you from BBC World News. The Democratic Republic of Congo has expelled the Rwandan ambassador, accusing neighbouring Kigali of supporting M23 rebels. Over the weekend, fighters from the rebel group seized a key town, forcing thousands of residents to flee. Earlier today, protesters in the eastern city of Goma took to the streets, demanding the government take stronger action against Rwanda. The BBC's Ian Wafula has the report. A quick look at some other stories making headlines now. And two men whose convictions for the assassination of Malcolm X were overturned last year will receive a $36 million settlement. Mohammed Aziz and Halil Islam both spent more than 20 years in prison for the murder of the iconic civil rights activists. They always denied wrongdoing and were released in the 1980s. But their names were only cleared last year by the Supreme Court, which called their convictions a failure of justice. 
And in the Central African Republic, a special criminal court has issued an historic conviction against three militia over war crimes committed in 2019. Uh, the three men, two of which were given 20 years each, whilst one received a life sentence for killing dozens of civilians. The court was established four years ago to prosecute war crimes committed in the country suffering from a crippling civilian war. Despite backing uh, from Russian mercenaries, various rebel groups continue to hold two-thirds of the country. Well, do stay with us because coming up, we are rebranding Black Britain. We're showcasing the talent from the African and African, Africa Caribbean world that are proving to be role models, real life role models, and making a real difference to today's young. Welcome back. And in a nail-biting election, Brazil's left-wing former president has made a stunning comeback and return to power two decades after he first came into office. By a very narrow margin, the left-wing Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva was elected president, beating by just two percentage points the far-right incumbent Jair Bolsonaro. He has yet to concede. Our South America correspondent Katie Watson reports. And we're going to cross over and get some breaking news from the world of sport. Why are you laughing? It is. Absolutely. <laughs> and it is beautiful because the match literally ended 20 seconds ago, Luquesa. Uh -huh. And the defending champions, the Mamelody Sundowns of the African Women's Champions League, have won their opening game 2 1 against the, uh, the debutants, uh, Bayesla Queens. Now, in the first game, in the opening game of this uh, Women's Champions League, you'll be pleased to know, Luquesa, that Zambia's Green Buffalo got off to a winning start with a 4-0 win over the Determined Girls of Liberia. And we'll sure be following their adventure in this Mid 2020 World Cup. Good question. And there'll be more tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Pierre Antoine, thank you very much. You can get hold of Pierre Antoine on social media. He is Danny underscore uh, BBC. I'm at Le Quest of Europe. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. This is BBC World News. I'm Matthew Emery Waller. On today's global, nine arrests after a deadly bridge collapse in the Indian state of Gujarat. 141 people are known to have died. Most of the bodies recovered are of women and children. I was here on the bridge. We fell in the centre. I was able to escape, but I couldn't find my sister. We'll have the latest from the town and the latest on the investigation, also on the programme. Ukrainian rockets attack Russian positions as the pushback continues despite Moscow targeting more of the country's infrastructure. We have a special report from the front line. Look at it. Desolation. This is what months of attritional warfare does to a town. Britain's embattled Home Secretary Suella Braverman is forced to defend her record over both the security of her own emails and conditions for asylum seekers. The British people deserve to know which party is serious about stopping the invasion on our southern coast and which party is not. I'm Laura Trevelyan in President Joe Biden's hometown of Scranton, here in the battleground state of Pennsylvania, where I've been talking to voters one week before the crucial U.S. midterm elections.
Hello and welcome to BBC News. Police in India have detained nine people after the deaths of 141 people killed after a suspension bridge collapsed in Gujarat. A BBC reporter at the scene said most of the bodies being recovered were of women and children. They'd been on a pedestrian bridge celebrating a religious festival. Just a warning, the footage we're about to show you is distressing because the bridge had only just reopened after repair work and there are reports it had not yet received a safety certificate. People had been seen on the bridge rocking it and trying to make it sway just before it collapsed into the river. Here's Yugita Lamai. Well, do stay with us because uh, still to come here on today's Global, we're in the US state of Pennsylvania, the state where President Biden was born. We'll be assessing how voters there are feeling just a week before the US midterm elections. That's next. Welcome back to Global here on BBC World News. Let's turn to UK politics because the UK Interior Minister has said that the immigration system in Britain is, quote, broken and illegal migration is out of control. She was responding to an urgent question from the opposition about an overcrowded migrant processing centre in southern England. Suella Braverman denied failing to sign off on measures which could have eased the pressures despite being warned that the government was acting outside of the law. She insisted she would never ignore legal advice. Sounds like it almost could be a line from the office there. Doug Fink, thank you so much. The president of Pennsylvania Paper and Supply Company. And so that, Matthew, that was uh, the inspiration for Dunder Mifflin in the office, that company, just showing the historic nature of Scranton here in this battleground state of Pennsylvania. Fascinating stuff. Laura, thanks once again. Uh, that is it from today's Global. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time. Bye bye. Hello there. Let's take a look at the latest weather forecast across Europe.